Welcome. Oh, I see we've got Juanita walking in. Welcome, Juanita. Um, so, <laughs> okay, we are very proud to, to be here today at the UCR Arts, Barbara and Art Culver Center of the Arts. My name is Katie Porter, and most of you know who I am, but I'll start out, that was actually apropos, I'll start out with some housekeeping. If you haven't already, turn off your cell phones. Okay, or si silence, they don't have to be off. Um, we are getting a little bit of a late start. We're just having some tech issues, but I think they might be getting resolved. Um, so while we are getting started, today we are here to celebrate the 10 year anniversary of Inlandia Literary Journeys. Do we all know what that is? Yeah. Raise your hand. Yeah? Okay. Yay! So, <laughs> if you had asked us 10 years ago where we'd be with this column in, in 10 years, I don't think um, we would have said, still here. We might not. So I'm so glad that we are. But before we officially get started, and I introduce my co-host, uh, Inlandia would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kawea, Tongva, and Luisenyo peoples, and all of their ancestors past and present and future. And we thank them for allowing us to live and work on their, their ancestral homelands. And yay, we have tech. <laughs> so um, with that, I would like to say uh, we are here today with John Bender, AKA Brutus Chieftain, AKA um, all the other names he goes by. He has many aliases. Uh, Bombastus, Henry <laughs> Heaven, uh, simply Brutus. Um, Is that like simply orange juice? Simply no, because Brutus? I, I dropped the, the last name. Just oh, Brutus. okay. Now you just Brutus. Got right, it. Right. Okay, good. So um, we are here to talk about the origins of the column and also to uh, share with you 15 of our columnists out of many who have uh, read for the columns over the years. So with that, um, I'm going to come on over to my seat and columnists yeah yeah john's gonna talk for a second well yes up till probably 7 p.m last night i was trying to figure out first of all i was trying to remember the launch and if i'd known that we would have this event i would have taken notes or been more mindful but last night I was at the Pomona Fair um, at the John Fogarty concert. And John Fogarty had a sense of joy about him because he has recently regained uh, all the rights to his songs, to his creations. And then it dawned on me that what we're celebrating today is all of our creations. As much as he created classical music, we created a whole literary scene here through Inlandia and the press enterprise, the columns that still continue. And um, it's amazing. So right now I wanna start out by just saying, everybody here, readers, writers, editors, photographers, everyone here who's been involved in Inlandia, just stand up and let's give you a round of applause because we're celebrating your creations. Stand up again. I want everybody to stand up because you're all involved in it because you're all here. And that's an amazing thing in the Inland Air Empire because this is an area that's been looked down upon uh, and denigrated. And, and yet we have managed to create something that most other regions haven't, a vibrant literary community. So thank you, everybody. And I got to be a part of it. And it's just amazing. Well, you weren't just a part of it. You were the instigator. You were the primary instigator for this column. So I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So a little bit of history. Um, we were holding a reading series called Litlandia 
at one of the libraries in town. And this guy who called himself Brutus used to show up for these readings. He didn't identify himself as a member of the press. He was definitely keeping his alter ego separate at that point. But we got to talking. Um, and simultaneous to that, Ed and Landia, um, my predecessor, Marion Mitchell Wilson, who uh, was the first executive director of Inlandia, she and I had been noticing, and she in particular had noticed in the newspaper, there was something called the Artist Spotlight column, which focused on artists in the region. And we kept thinking, we need one for writers. Um, so somehow she arranged, and if anybody has more of this background, raise your hand, maybe Francis, I don't know. Um, thinking of people who've been here and Ellen, who've been here this whole time. Um, but somehow we found ourselves having a meeting at the press and this column became a reality. So um, I, I have that her to thank and John. And it also coincided with the new editor at the Press Enterprise, Nels Jensen. Mm -hmm. And when he took over, he wanted to engage with the community. He wanted to have much more community involvement than we had, rather than us just being in that new five-story building that they just built for us. So I, I can't remember whether he asked me to call Inlandia to set up the meeting or whether the meeting was already set up, but all I knew was one evening we had everyone who might want to be a columnist from Inlandia and the board members come in and met with me, and then Orlando Ramirez, a great friend of mine who sadly passed away uh, last month yeah, from we'll pneumonia. That in anyway, he was at the meeting, Nels was at the meeting, and we talked about how to do the column. And of course, to start it, they needed someone to agree to be the editor of it. And I volunteered because I love writing. And, you know, my Brutus Alter Eagle, I was already involved with Inlandia secretly. And I thought, that's great. I'll get paid to read these columns, to learn, <laughs> to learn more about this area. The uh, literary life of this area, and uh, I'll get to meet the writers, so it's worked out well. Yeah, and, and Orlando was involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, Orlando and John were our primary contacts at the newspaper, and as John mentioned, um, sadly Orlando passed away in March, so we, we want to remember him today, and one of the things that he was most involved with, I'm not sure how deeply involved in the editing process he was, but he was always there in the beginning for the other component, which were our video interviews with writers. So um, I just am going to play just a little snippet of one. You might recognize somebody in this video. Um, Ellen. and. This is uh, an interview with our own Ellen, who's going to be reading today, um, talking about her memoir that she was writing back then called Becoming Iranian, which now is called Exit Prohibited. And so let's just watch a short clip. Let's see. Whoops, come on, come back. Oh. If I can make my, I'm going to walk over to the Mac and see if I can make it work. This did work when I tested it at home, so of course. Escape. Oh, oh, that's a good point. Maybe not. How about, let's do this. technical difficulties. That is, if it won't work, it won't work. You guys, okay. Well, yeah, you can tell about it. Orlando can, didn't edit the columns. He left that to me. In fact, he told me, all right, you're now the editor of these. And, but he was going to Cal State San Bernardino at the time, earning his master's degree in creative writing. And Orlando had been a, a poet forever. He was a very good poet. He often sent me his poems. And I would secretly share them with Katie because Orlando was very private. And he'd been part of a poets group 
I believe in San Jose in the early 70s, along with Gary Soto and some others, a Chicano poetry group. So he was well known up there, and he had many, many friends who were top poets. So he would comment if, if I missed something in the editor or if he thought I should have asked something. And then he definitely wanted to be part of these videos. And he would show up and he would ask some very good questions. And Orlando knew his stuff, and it's sad that he's gone. And he was a big help. And we, we both kind of thought that these videos would help us preserve the literary scene, the literary life of this town, of this community at the time. Of course, we weren't just Riverside. We're, we brought in people from all over. Hello. Yay. I got it. Yay. Okay. So if anybody would like to watch these videos, I can tell you if you go to Inlandia's YouTube page and look at the playlists, there is one that uh, brings together all of the Press Enterprise of recorded Inlandia literary journeys. So please do go and check them out. They do preserve a lot of history. I think it's it's just absolutely wonderful that they're there. So, all right. So with that, um, we're going to be bringing up many readers today. And readers, um, just I will call out your name when it is time, but hopefully you um, took a gander at the list and know generally where you're at. <laughs> hopefully. Okay. So our very first reader today is going to be Carlos Cortez. Come on up, Carlos. All right. Oh, I, by the way, I add to the history of when we first met at the Press Enterprise, the first group of us, they also took our pictures. We walked one by one, took our pictures. Uh, that was 10 years ago. So, oh, and so one of the wonderful things about aging is when you have old pictures behind you, there. they still appear with the column. And, and as one who turned uh, 89 last month, I'd love to have a 79-year-old picture of me up on the screen. Uh, it's wonderful. So thank you, John, for having, keeping uh, the same pictures coming up all the time. Uh, and so I thought for this, I would go back and go to one of my early columns. In fact, this is the third column I wrote. Uh, it just so happens to be the column which I got the most response ever uh, in terms of people writing me and saying they had read it and commenting on it and people talked to me about it. So I will read that column. Uh, and it's about a form of writing which most people don't write about, which is writing lectures for lecturing on cruise ships. <laughs> the stranger got on the cruise ship elevator, smiled, and then gave me the finger. <laughs> That's right, the upraised middle finger. I nodded, smiled back, and returned the favor. <laughs> Thus began our brief, friendly, lighthearted conversation. Let me explain. My memoir, Rose Hill and Intermarriage Before Its Time, was published by Heyday in collaboration with Inlandia. But publication does not end the memoir journey because life continues to write new chapters even after words have been committed to a page. My memoir journey took an unusual, somewhat bizarre jog in October 2013 when I became a lecturer on a cruise ship, sailing from Istanbul and visiting Turkey's Mediterranean coast in the Greek islands. My lecture series was on cultural differences and similarities. For my opening talk on day two of the cruise, I lectured on the varying significance of hand gestures in different cultures, <laughs> illustrating my talk with PowerPoint. Frequent ohs, ahs, and laughter from the several hundred people in the audience suggested that 
they're surprised at how innocuous gestures in one culture could be inappropriate, even offensive, in other cultural contexts. For example, the seemingly innocent V-shaped peace sign, peace sign, if used in certain parts of Greece, could be interpreted as the insulting Greek half mutza. A full mutza uses all five fingers. The lecture went fine, followed by requisite applause. Afterward, numerous audience members approached me with other illustrations of gestures, which I noted for use in future lectures. Case closed, I thought. Later that day came an urgent, sweetheart, you're on TV, interjection from my wife, Laurel. There I was on one of the ship's internal TV channels, filling our stateroom TV screen, gesturing wildly, striding back and forth across the huge stage and furiously clicking, uh, clicking my PowerPoint to display photos of myriad uses of fingers, arms, and parts of the face. Now, normally I avoid watching tapes of myself giving talks. But this time I was fascinated and stayed with it to the end. Not bad, I concluded. Actually pretty interesting. It was still interesting the next time we turned on the TV and found me in another part of the talk. But the following day, after three more increasingly brief encounters with my televised self, I was growing pretty tired of me. <laughs> the weariness increased in the ensuing days as my lecture appeared again and again. I soon began feeling like the lead character in Groundhog Day. <laughs> Wandering through the ship's sumptuous buffet restaurant, I spotted a passenger staring at me. Catching my eye, he gave me a thumbs up, one of my cross-cultural examples. I returned the thumbs up, up shot several more thumbs throughout the restaurant. Later that day came a bull sign. I had explained that the bull sign meant hook them horns at a University of Texas football game. But in other cultural contexts, it could mean things like, you've been cuckolded. <laughs> I didn't take the passenger's bull sign personally, and I didn't, nor did I check it out with Laurel. As the days went by, the truth became clearer. While a few hundred people had seen me lecturing in the theater, maybe a thousand or so had seen me, and seen me, and seen me, in the comfort of their rooms. I was everybody's Groundhog Day, minus I got you, babe. Shipwide, I had become the gestures guy. And what better way to acknowledge me than to greet me with gestures that I had discussed in my talk? So for the next 10 days, I never knew when I was likely to encounter a mutza, a bull sign, a nose thumb, a temple tap, or a chin flick. And of course, the occasional upraised middle finger. So it was natural that I courteously exchanged middle fingers with my unknown elevator companion, who neither gave nor viewed it as an insult. He was just acknowledging the gestures guy. Oh, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Carlos. That was that was fun. And I because we've been doing this so long now, I've forgotten a lot of these columns. So it's fun to hear them again. So next up we have Ellen Estelite. I'm going to switch. And this, what's her, yeah, my husband always says that. He's right. He's right, yeah, <laughs> as usual. Um, and this appeared uh, April uh, 2015, I believe. A few months ago, several of my erudite Facebook friends posted a, a list of 10 books that they had stayed with, that had stayed with them over the years. I posted my own list of 10 books, plus two more, not surprisingly heavy on creative nonfiction. Of course, like any such list, mine was full of gaping holes. What, no Doris Lessing? Asked my friend Bonnie. Busted. I bought the Golden Notebook 40 years ago, but had never read it. There was no Joyce Carol Oates either, although I had written my MA thesis on the evolution of the Byronic hero in her first five novels. 
and there was no Johnny and his mule. How could I have omitted a book that had been so much a part of my early life? Some books get inside you and stay there. Others, you climb inside. Our yearning to get lost in a book starts early. Years ago, in Iran, I was reading Goodnight Moon to my daughter Samira when she suddenly became very agitated. Leaning forward, almost falling off my lap, she pointed at the dollhouse in the red and green centerfold page and said in Persian, I want to get inside it. I knew the feeling. When I was a small girl in Pennsylvania, I spent countless hours willing myself inside Johnny's village in the great smoky mountains of North Carolina. I was deep inside those black and white photographs that illustrated the story. As Johnny tried to motivate the bulky mule, he bought at auction for five cents, the one that made him late for school. I agonized over his buyer's remorse. I cringed as his classmate Nancy Bell tried to get the mule to move by twisting his ear. I tagged along as Johnny's kind teacher, Miss Mary, walked home with him to tell him his mam to tell his mammy and pappy they were stuck with a useless mule. In the end, Johnny prevailed, luring the mule home with an ear of corn just held just out of its reach. Instead of giving Johnny a licking, his pragmatic pappy put the perpetually hungry mule to work by dangling more corn in front of it as he plowed the family's potato patch. I'd like to think that my five-year-old self was uncomfortable with the existential agony of the mule's Sisyphean plight, but I can't remember for sure. When Iranians want to say that someone has influence, they say, Kharish mire, his donkey moves. <laughs> Every time I heard that expression, I thought of Johnny's bulky mule and the effort it took to get him to fudge. I partnered with that book almost 34 years ago, but not willingly. Like everything else we owned, it was a casualty of the Iranian Revolution. When I was growing up, Johnny and his mule was the only autographed book in our house. The author was native North Carolinian Ellis Cradle, 1902 to 1998. And the photographer was her husband, Charles Townsend. In 1946, the year the book was published, my parents, picking up their lives after World War II, shared the Townsend's Washington, D.C. home. My mother, dismissed from her wartime job as a reporter for the Washington Post to make way for returning soldiers, did the cooking in exchange for rent. Other childhood treasures left behind in Iran were lost forever, but I could order a replacement Johnny for Johnny on Amazon. Its third-party seller generously described the condition of his only copy as acceptable. When it slid out of its bubble wrap, envelope a few weeks ago, I felt a thrill of recognition. I looked inside to see who had loved this book to within an inch of its life. Many children had, apparently. The pages bore the repeated stamp of Love Memorial School in Lincolnton, North Carolina. The last due date stamped on the loan record was November 20, 68. On the back inside cover, someone had scrawled Dis in black marker, discontinued dispensed with, dissed. Apparently the book's condition was not accepted, any more than the slightly archaic language out of reach of the average elementary school student. Johnny was tolling his mule along instead of leading or enticing. There were titter-inducing archaisms with contemporary meanings too much within reach. Johnny lived in Horny Hollow, after all. <laughs> On his way home from school, he met Uncle Boogermore Bennett. <laughs> and afraid of what his pappy would say, Johnny wasn't feeling very gay. <laughs> all of these are tinder for, bon for a bonfire of upper graders, <laughs> snark and derision. Perhaps it was just that Cradle's donkey no longer moved. That a spunky mountain farm boy was no match for a boy wizard. No hogs. Just Hogwarts, thank you very much. That's the way of the world, I suppose. So, good night, Moon. Good night, Uncle Boogerman, Boogermore. And good night to all those books destined to be dis before our grandchildren had a chance to read them. Do you still have it? Yes, I do. <laughs> oh.
uh, that that was very sweet. I again, I've forgotten all about that. I remember the title, but um, all right. So moving right along, um, we are going to bring up Rebecca K. O'Connor. Come on up, Rebecca. Hello. So this one's just from last year, but I decided to read it because I've been writing for the whole 10 years for the column, and this is the only one I've gotten a letter from prison for. <laughs> last summer, I stepped outside at dawn to the angry cries of two ravens. I was puzzled when I saw a cat with its tail tucked low bolting away from my house. The ravens dove at it, pulling tufts of fur as it went. Then I saw the problem. There was a fledgling raven in my yard. It was feathered enough to fly, but too weak to get off the ground. I scooped up the raven, felt the sharp breastbone of a starving bird inside. I had worked in wildlife rehabilitation and as a zookeeper in my younger years, I told myself that I would see if I could get it through the night and then decide what to do. Baelish, as the raven ended up being named, was settled into a dog crate on my screened in porch. I'm a falconer with a chest freezer stocked with meat meant for hawks. I knew what to give him. After drinking copious amounts of water and enjoying a meal of thawed mice, bits of quail, and soaked dog food, the raven perked up. He made it through the night and in the morning called back and forth to his parents who sat on a pole outside my house fretting. I decided it would only be a few days before I could return him to his parents. Then for what ended up being up over a week, I fed him, let him build up his flight skills, and watched his parents keep close watch on our progress. They were not pleased. <laughs> they were even less pleased when I set him, set him on the open porch door and he would not join them. Instead, he returned to the safety of his crate. Then the questions that led to stories started. Who was I to the Ravens? Was I a kidnapper or a helper? I was formerly known as the redheaded woman who walked about with hawks on her glove. I knew one word in Raven. I'm pretty sure it was a curse word that means hawk. <laughs> in the past, it was all they ever said to me. Now their language was varied in tones I had never heard before. When Baelish finally joined them, they scolded me when they saw me, but they didn't yell hawk at me anymore. I could only tell the ravens who I was through my actions, and I told myself a story about who I wanted to be. I started asking myself questions about my place in the urban wildlife interface of my yard and spun small tales on my Facebook page. My mom once told me that I live my life like I'm telling myself a story. She's probably right, because I think that the stories we tell ourselves shape who we become. I feel the most connected to the people and the places that I love when I'm telling myself stories about nature. When I spend time outside seeking the questions that nature presents, I can feel the positive shift in my mental and physical health. That should be no surprise. I work as the co-executive director for Rivers and Lands Conservancy in Riverside and have read many of the copious studies on the benefits of nature. I have read studies that quantify the mental and physical benefits of simply peering out a window at trees. I have read studies that argue that nature is a basic human need. At the Conservancy, we make hard to make sure our community has places to absorb these benefits. As a writer, I believe that nature is the wellspring of the most important stories that we tell ourselves and that we tell others. My favorite works of narrative nonfiction do not try to explain the author to the world. Instead, the author tries to explain the world to themselves. And when I write about nature, I discover a world where I may not always be wanted, but one in which I belong. The summer ended without my question answered. I still do not know who I was to the Ravens. I watched them thrive together and Baelish moved on perhaps to make his own family. Some stories do not need their questions to be answered. The answers are left to the reader. This spring, I spotted the ravens building a new nest right across the street in a pine just high enough for a perfect view into my porch and laughed. 
They successfully raised three chicks. This might have been because I threw broad mice on the roof when the chicks awkwardly fledged. It might be because I helped the parents guard the one that fledged a few days too soon. It might be that I have my answer. I think I'm destined to go ah oh, after the end of every one of these because I do remember that I remember I remember seeing Baelish. Um, so John, let's can we take a second and let's just talk a little bit more history before we go to the next one. Take a mic, any mic. Um, I was just gonna say, um, I was really thrilled with the way the, the column was progressing in the beginning. And, but at first, we were being published on Tuesdays, and we weren't being put into the online edition. So it felt, you know, we were, um, we did have our own blog. Um, and I don't remember the origins of that, but I remember being very happy when they finally decided, well, I shouldn't say happy, but they did away with the blog for various reasons, but that then um, was the stepping stone to get our columns into the newspaper, which I think opened up our readership to um, many, many more people. In prison, yes. <laughs> Good, we want access, full access to everyone. At, at newspapers, there are some very serious mind. There's some very serious-minded people at newspapers, overly serious, and it was always a slight battle to continue the column because not everyone supported it, and also to get it online. Um, so Orlando and I were always trying to maneuver and keep this thing alive because not again, as I said, not everyone's a supporter. Other side is why are we doing this? It's just extra work. But of course, we had a, a, a good friend in Nels, the editor, and Orlando and I uh, made our donkeys walk enough to keep the column going. But yeah, that's why. So everything, so everything took some behind the scenes politicking. Which we were grateful for. Yeah, thank you. If we didn't have that insider's perspective, I don't think we could have ever taken the next step. And yeah, so thank you, John, and thank you, Orlando. Yeah. All right, so I want to bring up our next reader. Um, Go back to the chair. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> well, you can stay in the chair if you want. We'll, okay, we have next up Larry Burns. Larry, come on down. between the pictures. <laughs> A couple things have changed since. Um, and I'm grateful that uh, this column has been there to capture some of that as a writer. Uh, it's a great place to return to to see how I've evolved um, and hopefully improved. Um, and certainly I'm glad today I picked a column like Carlos that was uh, one that was well received that a lot of people gave me feedback about. And, uh, and like everybody else, it references animals. So uh, here we go. How a neighborhood cat helps to inspire different perspectives. This is from August of 2022. I'm what is known as a regional writer. I take inspiration from the flora and fauna, the places and faces of where I live and play. Because I value community, I spend time outdoors to recharge my creative energies and find new stories to share. My subjects typically include the people, places, and events around the Inland Empire. Like many creatives, I generally return to the same sources for inspiration, seeking renewable sources and renewable mater reusable materials. One way for a writer to keep those sources charged and ready is by approaching those places from a new perspective. In my current draft manuscript of a sci-fi adventure novel, I play around with narrative choices to achieve this end while describing a mysterious antagonist. To help me gather many stories in a single scene, the narration is broken into several character perspectives told in an overlapping fashion. 
The result is a scene with more ways to attract and hold the reader's attention. The action is made richer with multiple views of the same character. When I want to do the same thing in real life, I'd likewise bring in new narr narrators to learn more about the person or place that I know well. When I write creative nonfiction, that means talking to historians or visiting a research librarian at Riverside Public Library. Regardless of setting, I believe writers must invite other storytellers into the conversation. One source of my creativity is walking. I've always found movement in nature stimulating to new ideas, and as a result, several days a week, you can find me hoofing the hilly avenues of Canyon Crest, one of the dozens of distinct residential neighborhoods in Riverside. Walking my neighborhood on a regular basis has, for several years in a row, characters naturally take shape. My neighborhood is diverse in terms of flags, landscape choices, and beliefs about where cars are supposed to be parked. I have many fine neighbors. I've even nominated one for a civic award, and he won. Nowadays, my inspiration is a cat named James. James proved different from other cats, and not just because of his gender-confounding pluralized name. This is what happens when I let my four-year-old daughter name somebody else's pet. One of the first things I know about James is he possesses the effortless confidence of a cat, but the lust for life of a dog. He's developed a Pavlovian sense of who or what is crossing his turf. He's learned the sound of the cart my wife and I push our daughter in. And typically we meet James trotting towards us, meowing a greeting at the about the midpoint of our walk. This encouragement and affectionate leg rubs and head butts into our outstretched hands make me glad I decided to walk when the easier choice is to stay inside. I admit feeling pretty special from James's attention and his behavior, and imagine my curiosity when I began to hear other tales about unusual cats in the neighborhood. It turned out James is a social butterfly with an entire dance cart of friends to meet and greet. Each of my neighbors called him or her by a different name. James, Tux, Kitty, Oreo, Stash, International Cat of Mystery. <laughs> Almost as many as uh, Johnny Bender. He's associated with several addresses and at least one locale. We were all talking about the same character. Each of us held a different version of this cat in our imagination. But those stories all culminate in a joyful feeling of being singled out by your friendly neighborhood kitty cat. After capturing all of these feline myths, I had no choice but to seek out the origin story. So I approached the people at the house. We most often found him around. And it turns out James has a habit of choosing his own pals. The cat appeared at my neighbor's house four years ago. Neither hungry nor frightened, he hung around for several days just lounging on the porch. Naturally, this led to feedings and sometimes soft, uh, something soft to sleep on. But then a girl showed up and claimed the cat back. Two weeks later, the cat reappeared. They waited for the girl to return, but she did not. They named the cat Stash because of his distinct thin black mustache. They loved and appreciated his various neighborhood personas. To them, he is both their pet and everybody else's tomcat. He avoids certain dogs and plays with others using a valid yet unknown metric. My inspirational cat also provides life lessons on how to win friends and influence people. Sometimes we spy James far from his normal perch in those cases he pretends not to know us. And that's okay. I like a story that doesn't make it too easy to hold on to. I like mysteries, even though I don't write them myself. I ask lots of questions, filling out the true tales of my favorite neighborhood cat, but I did not confirm if James is a boy cat or a girl cat. Regardless of name or gender, that's one cool cat. Thank you. Ah, all right. Thank you, Larry. So next up, we have Ruth Nolan. Come on up, Ruth. Ourselves. <laughs> Inspired or tortured? Um, I'm really honored to be here. I'm so happy to be here. So happy to be here. And um, I'm here with Melania since Melania was just a little puddle on the sidewalk. So just to see how it's grown and the people who've made it and nourished it and built it, it's just really amazing. And I um, just want to say it's funny because when this column started, I didn't have any grandkids, now I have four. Just in the last 10 years, so it's 
shows how radically my life has changed and it's very meaningful to still be connected um, here. This piece is um, actually part of my ongoing humanities project. It's called Fire on the Mojave, stories from the deserts and mountainous of the inland Southern California. So I live in the desert, so I'm kind of your desert reporter person, <laughs> a little desert link. Inland Empire stories of wildfire loss, <clears throat> resilience, and renewal shape our lives. So I wrote this in October 2020. <clears throat> so we had just been going through the summer of the beginning of the pandemic. To the memory of the five <clears throat> Idlewild Engine Crew 57 firefighters who died fighting the Esperanza Fire in October 2006, and the U.S. Forest Service hotshot crew member who lost his fight his life fighting the El Dorado fire in September 2020. That was the infamous gender reveal fire. To live in the Inland Empire is to live with wildfire. This past summer, as many of us sheltered at home during the ongoing coronavirus pandemic and record-breaking heat, several major fire events raged through our region, forcing the evacuation of thousands of residents, destroying property, burning hundreds of thousands of acres and mountains with the desert. Like other residents, I stayed indoors to avoid breathing smoke-filled air and watch fire media coverage in shock and sadness. As a former wildland firefighter, I couldn't help feeling that I should be out there doing something to help fight these fires. After all, I once worked on fires right here in our mountains and deserts. Instead, I turned to working on my humanities project, Fire in the Mojave. Looking through my notes and research, I was reminded that wildfire is part and parcel of shaping our region's diverse ecologies and that wildfires have frequently burned here in the millennium and will continue to do so. Understanding wildfire and its immediate and lasting impacts is at a critical threshold. It's not enough to understand the science behind why and how fires burn. We are obliged to develop sustainable relationships with wildfire, even as we stand in awe and hide from these forces of these fires. These relationships go back for centuries and are reflected in the stories and practices of our region's first people. Kauia Indians, for example, have recorded the strategic use of fire in parts of their creation story. The book Tamilpak, Kauia Indian Usage and Knowledge of Plants, in collaboration between Lowell J. Bean and Catherine Kauia, Catherine Siva Sabel, depicts part of the Kauia creation story. In the beginning, they laid a woman, Nimawat, palm on her back, and all wood horse fly, took a wooden spindle and drilled her. First blood, then fire came forth. This woman then became a palm tree. According to Kauia Serrano and culture bearer Ernest Siva, the Kauia also ignited wildfires to burn and cleanse desert palm trees, an oasis, and other resources such as mesquite, an important food source. These indigenous practices are also described in depth in Before the Wilderness, Environmental Management by Native Californians, edited by Kat Anderson and Thomas C. Black. Unfortunately, displacement and elimination of many fire practices of Native people here and across California and the West, followed by fire suppression practices done by the U.S. Forest Service in an increase of wildfire events due to human activities resulting from widespread urbanization, has resulted in a sense that wildfires here signal a form of apocalypse unique to our place. 20th century iconic writers Nathaniel Lewis and Joan Didion have depicted the terrors of wildfire, the defining element of life, life in our region. Can you hear me? Nathaniel Lewis and Joan Didion, both who have written about our region. In the Day of the Locust, <coughs> Lewis portrays a fictionalized wildfire apocalypse descending down upon the corrupt <coughs> celluloid promises of Hollywood coming down from the San Gabriel Mountains. In Los Angeles Notebook, Didion famously writes about how our people here have weathered wildfire events. Tonight, a Santa Ana wind will begin to blow, a hot wind from the northeast winding down from the Cajon and San Gregorio passes, blowing up sandstorms out along Route 66, drawing the hills and nerves to flashpoint. For a few days now, we will see smoke back in the canyons. 
Other writers have expressed the impacts of wildfire on doomsday scenarios. In Red Flag, the Inland Empire's and recently deceased Mike Davis has written, has written, and this was following the Dome Fire in 2020 out in the desert. Our burning deserts are regional expressions of a global trend. A world set on fire by climate change has unleashed a dangerous transformation of plant ecology and thus faunal populations from the Arctic to Patagonia, Montana to Mongolia. And other writers have expressed the toll that fire here takes on residents' life and how we cope and adapt. In her story, A Panorama Fire, Jessica Weiland does documents her family's evacuation from their Lytle Creek home during the 1980 Panorama Fire. Some of you might remember that, I do. Um, it took out most of North San Bernardino, up near Cal State. Um, she wrote, fire forces you to judge all your things in minutes and decide which are worthy of saving. Fire comes along as a great simplifier. This house. And in the poem Litany, desert writer Cynthia Anderson expresses anger over the careless behaviors that ignite some of our wildfires. In fact, most of our wildfires. Arsonists, lightning, exhaust pipes, engine fires, sparks from weed whackers, rockets from gender reveal parties, uncontrollable combustion. Recently, I drove to the site of several of our area's major wildfire events to document these changes for a new section on my humanities project. At one site, a fire that burned in Joshua Tree National Park more than 20 years ago. There were Joshua trees that had partially burned but showed remarkably recovery with new limbs and green shoots. At another burned site near Big Bear, a group of young pine trees demonstrated the resilience of regrowth and regeneration, arcing skyward amidst acres of charred phantom tree trunks. A western scrub jay, a bird that thrives in burn zones such as these flit about in their greenery. This is symbolic of the resilience that our area's residents persistently demonstrate as we continue to rebuild, rebuild and persevere, telling our stories, making our adaptations, knowing that it's just a matter of time before fire returns, and that it is we who must adapt. Yeah, we're we've got a pile of columns up here at the front. <laughs> it's okay. We'll have a collection at the end. So, uh, thank you so much, Ruth, and apologies for any um, mic issues we've had. I think we we're okay for the moment. Um, so the next person I want to bring up is May May Wagner Marinello. Come on up, May. Something um, I'll say while May is making her way to the front is that we have writers from all over the region, very literally, you know, Ruth is here from the desert. We have another writer who writes from Wrightwood, another out in Landers, um, San Bernardino, Redlands, um, Banning, or Banning or Beaumont? Banning. Banning, yeah. So we're, we're all trying to be our reporters for our region here. So. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna put you up there. You're not Ruth. Here you go. The switch. You're welcome. I was just curious which picture is gonna go up. Okay. <laughs> the one that. That one. Oh, I disliked that picture intensely, even though it was when I was younger. Okay. Am I coming through okay on my. Oh, up close. Okay. Um, first of all, this column that I'm going to read to you, I got the most responses from uh, people that I'd received on anything that I had written. It seemed to resonate with a lot of people and inspire them. And, um, but, oh, okay. <laughs> all righty. Um, I also, I just brought a couple of pictures and they're available. Anyone would, would want to see them at some point. But my mother was born in a sod house and her mother is holding her in this picture. And in the other picture, my mother is holding her firstborn child. 
Okay. It's as if I drift between two worlds, one of more than 80 years ago and one of my present life. This, this drifting is the way you feel when you are engrossed in reading a good book and its characters follow you right off the pages, weaving themselves into your thoughts until you must reluctantly bid them goodbye. The difference is, this is no novel. It is real life found in a box of old letters written primarily by my mother, Alice May. A few were written by my dad, Bud. The letters traveled from the Dakotas to Kansas, where my dad was from. My mother poured her heart out to my dad's sister, Vi, who saved them. When Vi died, my uncle was going to trash them, but my cousin rescued them for me. I will be forever grateful, as these letters provide a prologue to a time I never knew, a time when my parents loved one another. A letter postmarked September 23, 1934, was written when my mother was expecting my parents' first child. Buddy is so good to me. I'm thankful he is so understanding and considerate. Bud rubs my back for me at night. The next letter dated November 21st, 1934, four days after my mother had given birth to a baby daughter they named Anita May, but nicknamed Babe. She wrote, Bud stayed with me during it all. One nurse tried to make him go, but he refused. It, the birth was terrible. Well, it was such a comfort to have my buddy. That letter is so faded, parts of it are difficult to read. While well, other letters and postmarks appear as if they could have been written and mailed yesterday, except for the three cent stamp. In another letter, my mother wrote, Bud is trying to put her to sleep now. He is singing to her and she sings back to him. It was in that same letter where she wrote, there's quite a bit of whooping cough around here. Did it go with? Hello. Okay. What? I don't know where I left off. The whooping cough. The whooping cough. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's quite a bit of whooping cough around here. I'm afraid Babe will get it. I told Bud if she got sick, I believe I'd die. My mother could not know how prophetic that was, nor of the heartbreak and hardships that lay ahead. These were the years of the Great Depression. My parents lived on a small farm and barely got by. In one letter, my mother described how they got completely cleaned out Saturday night. Hail, wind, and destruction. Our wheat was all ready to combine. And that night, it hailed it down, plumb slick and clean. It was the first year we had anything since we were married. We have less than ever now. My mother often mentioned how she hated to be alone at night on the dark and isolated prairie when my dad worked, looked for work elsewhere. This was before telephones were available, so she was completely alone, except for the few livestock she had to tend. In one such case, she described how the coyotes killed 10 of her precious turkeys. First, I found a dead one, then another and another. Then I went on a run. It was so hot, I just about fell over in a faint. No one would have ever found me out clear out there. Hailstorms and coyotes and other catastrophes were, the least, were not the worst of it. In a letter written in June 1936, her prophecy had come true. Anita would have been one year and seven months old today if she were here. Sometimes my heart is so heavy, but it all sounds so empty, doesn't it? But writing helps some. I nearly go wild with lonesomeness and longing for my baby. I, who knew every crease and curve in that little baby body of hers, and now she has to lay still forever. After my two brothers and I were born, we moved to town. Four years later, my younger sister joined the family. My parents did not speak of the baby who died. However, in our attic, there was a box that contained such items as a baby shoe, a tin of 
baby powder, and a silver funeral decoration. Sometimes my little sister and I reverently examined the contents of the box and wondered about the sister we never knew. I don't think my mother, who was born in a sod house on her parents' homestead, ever thought she was very smart. However, the letters demonstrate how articulate she really was. Neither of my parents graduated from high school. If it were not for these letters, I would not have known how my parents once loved one another. That's important because I can't remember a time when they seemed happy. Instead, I and my siblings witnessed much bitterness during our chaotic growing up years. The two-sided bitterness stemmed from a land deal gone bad between my dad and my mother's father. My mother ultimately sided with her birth family and followed them to California with my sister and me. Of course, there's much more to the story and I will continue to drift between the words of the worlds of then and now as I read more of these treasured letters. The letters will continue to provide insight and understanding into the lives of my parents from a very long time ago. What a gift. And this seemed, appro this seemed appropriate since next Sunday is Mother's Day. The one lone microphone right now. Thank you, May. That that was beautiful. And I appreciate the opportunity that we all have for participating in this. Thank you, John. Yeah. So, John, can, can we talk a little more history? So, we'll I don't see. <laughs> well, I can, I'll try and jog your memory. I mean, at some point, Mel's left and things changed again at the paper, right? What? Well, before you left, when Nels left. Right. So. Pick a, pick a, pick a mic. Yeah. One of them I know is Nels for sure. Tested. Okay. Okay. Right. The paper has gone through a tremendous amount. When Nels was there, we were still owned, I believe, by Belo Corporation, which owns the Dallas Morning News. Then at some point, we got. Um, they sold us, well, let me back up. That's when we got that five-story building built. That's when we were growing. That's when the column started. That's when we got to make the videos. We had a whole video production room. Um, everything seemed to be going great. But then the effects of the recession hit, and the Dallas Morning News Corporation decided to dump us, even though we made a lot of money for them. Um, so then we got picked up by, uh, I believe it was the Orange County Register. And people at the time were saying, oh, this is great, because the Orange County Register owner has figured out how to keep newspapers alive. He's not doing this online thing. Well, he came to talk to us, and I realized right away, oh, no. This is another guy who doesn't know anything about the Inland Empire. He, he laid out all kinds of papers in this one room, and he was going to call it the, uh, instead of the Press Enterprise, it was going to be the Inland Empire Register. And we had to say, no. And he seemed to think that everyone had great feelings toward the register. And we said, that might be in Orange County, but not here. Anyway, so he ended up, they did remake the paper and some of the inside pages did say Inland Empire Register. But then he overextended himself because he thought he was a genius. And he started the Long Beach Register and the LA Register. And he started the LA Register uh, with, with a very, very conservative column or message, which alienated his potential readers right away. And then the, the, everything just kept going down because these things were failures. You know, you have to have enough money when you launch a product to keep it going for two years without making a profit. But he didn't. He thought everyone loved the Register and these would be embraced. So we, we lost money, we hemorrhaged money, and then uh, they went bankrupt. They declared bankruptcy, which was quite a shock to suddenly, for those of us who worked there, had no more sick pay or built up uh, vacation pay that we, were, we would have gotten just disappeared. So then we were supposed to be sold to the LA Times, I believe. But a judge decided, no, that would violate antitrust because 
um, the, the Times would control too much of the media in Southern California. So then instead we got bought by uh, Digital First Media News. And uh, the cutting continued. I'm gonna be nice about uh, as the atmosphere changed and then uh, we, yeah, Nels was gone. We had a editor from the register, register, and then we got another editor, a great editor named Kim, who's there now. But the newspaper business just declined. So, so that's why it's so amazing that the column continues that they stuck with it. And that's that's the point I was trying to make. It's like the Sorry for the history. Okay. <laughs> okay. You might be down to one. <laughs> it's okay. I know that um, our friends here at the Culver were scrambling to find batteries for all of them. So I just, the point that I wanted to make with that little piece of history and that I think John makes very, very clearly is that we are very lucky now to have people in our corner who are there with the paper, who believe in the column. Um, I know, John, you left yeah. the paper at one point, and you were... I've been gone three or four years now. Yeah. And I th but, of course, Mark Acosta, who is the current editor of the mm -hmm. Metro, he's a Metro editor of the Press Enterprise, he was a student of Carlos's at UC Riverside, and Mark is a, a big supporter of the call, and as well as Kim Gimmerin, who is yeah. the Inland Empire editor, senior editor. Yeah, so our, our editors there are very supportive of this column and we are grateful and that despite all of these many changes over a decade, that um, our presence has gone from being in the paper on Tuesdays, um, just in the print edition, not online, to now we're in all four of the regional papers thanks to some efforts on the behalf of Francis and others in our midst who um, who advocated for that. And I think it has been a really good um, addition. We have a, a large reach and we continue to uh, forge ahead. So with that, um, I want to bring up our next group of readers, which includes Francis Vasquez. Francis, yeah, you're up. Can you hear me? Okay. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. Okay. Because this is Cinco de Mayo weekend, I'm going to read to you a, a article that was published on the Sunday before the Cinco de Mayo. Growing up in High Grove, my parents took us to Cinco de Mayo fiestas either in Colton or Riverside. These were fun, family-friendly celebrations featuring music, food, raspados, mariachis, dances, games. We joyfully smashed colored cascarones, which are colored empty eggshells filled with confetti, and we cracked them on each other's heads. We had a lot of fun. Adults enjoyed speeches and patronized vendor booths, including Sociedad Progresista Mexicana, which is a bereavement benefit association. Why is Cinco de Mayo celebrated here in the United States? It commemorates a battle won in Mexico on this date in 1862, when the people of Puebla defended their turf against an invasion by Napoleon III's French army. Depending on who you ask, You'll get various answers, including an egregious, it's time to drink and party. <laughs> Our school text had nothing about El Cinco, although Chicanas like me have celebrated the holiday since childhood. Professor David E. Hayes Bautista suggests in his book, El Cinco de Mayo, an American tradition that ultimately it emerges as an important American holiday with roots in the Civil War and connects an emergent Mexican-American identity 
with the social and political turmoil of the United States during the 1860s. While our nation was distracted with rebellion at home, France launched an invasion in Mexico in 1861. Although Napoleon III blamed Mexico's suspension of debt payments for his aggression, his imperialistic goals became clear. French troops marched inland from the Gulf of Mexico to conquer the city of Puebla en route to the cap capital. Instead, Mexican General Ignacio Zaragoza led a valiant defense of Puebla that defeated the invaders on May the 5th, 1862. The victory only temporarily halted the French, yet it held immense symbolism for Mexicanos, Latinos, and California. At the outbreak of the Civil War, California's diverse Latino population included native-born Californios, Mexicans, Cubans, and other Spanish-speaking peoples. Hayes Bautista posits that the many juntas meetings that existed in California before the Civil War found common ground, cause, and identity by their support of a democratic Mexico and an emancipated United States. When Latinos in California received word of the Mexican victory at Puebla, Spanish language newspapers throughout the state extolled the triumph. Jubilant, people halted their work and held impromptu fiestas with music, fireworks, and patriotic speeches. The juntas raised money for the defense of the Mexican Republic and since 1863 continued the annual observance of May 5th in the state's public memory. By commemorating the Mexican resistance to French intervention on Cinco de Mayo, California Latinos found a cause that celebrated both ethnic solidarity and their loyalty to the United States. 100 years later, in the 1960s, during the Civil Rights Chicano Movement, Chicanos embraced El Cinco as a symbol of resistance to the discrimination and oppression of Latinos, symbolic of a David and Goliath battle, giving rise to Chicano power. <laughs> that was my era, right? Okay. In 1972, Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez published an epic poem, I Am Joaquin, Yo Soy Joaquin, which listed an itinerary of grievances, as my Chicano literature professor and youth Martinez would say. Gonzalez's poem is fondly appreciated by Chicanos. It gave voice to the revolutionary movement with a succinct statement of Chicano nationalism and ideology. It served as an enticement to resistance and battle cry to the movimiento. I'm going to read just a few of this long epic uh, 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 poem. I am Joaquin, lost in a world of confusion, caught up in a whirl of a gringo society confused by the rules, scorned by attitudes, suppressed by manipulations, and destroyed by modern society. My fathers have lost the economic battle and won the struggle of cultural survival. Unwillingly dragged by that monstrous, technical, industrial giant called progress. I am Aztec Prince and Christian Christ. I shall endure. I will endure. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity in Landia Institute to participate in the column because it gives voice 
to the diversity of the people of our region, and we're highly appreciative. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. And yay, we now have three fully operational microphones. Um, so I'm just going to put this here so we have our choices. Um, so next up, we have Ginger Galloway. Come on up, Ginger. I'm going to take a picture of me <laughs> and my and my background. Oh, that's not me. <laughs> there you go. You know what happens is you go to events and you have pictures of everybody else and there's no evidence that you were there. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. All right. Thank you. So the article that I'm going to read is from November of last year. It's titled, Inspiration to Write Comes at Any Time, Including at Night. And those of us, all of us as writers know that we have family members who do not appreciate what we do. <laughs> the scene comes to me in the middle of the night, of course. The characters from my latest manuscript are playing in my dreams. I pull my computer onto the bed. Glowing light from the screen causes him to stir, and I quickly lower the ambiance. He has complained before about the glow and the sound that typing 65 words a minute makes in the quiet of a sleeping house. But what am I to do, really? I can't let the imagery fade away into morning sunbeams. I type, my face illuminated, creative juices flowing from my fingertips, the billowing curtain next to the bed cheers me on. Why can I be this creative when I sit down to write during my scheduled author time in my planner? I'm certain at this rate, I'll win that no rhymo this time. I imagine the faces of my author friends when I will announce I have something worth reading at my weekly writer's group. The rhythm of the computer keys puts me in a trance. With a little more movement than necessary, he rolls over. Point received. I grabbed my robe on the way out and perched on the stairs, my computer balanced on my knees. I keep going. The creative flow is amazing. I can't remember the last time I was in the zone like this, inspired. I nod at myself, a little smug. I tap twice and start the next chapter just as a ball drops onto the keyboard. The dog, now also awake, <laughs> thinks it is time to play. I toss the ball and write another few words. The ball drops on the keyboard again. I toss the ball and type. I repeat the action, the dog tearing through the house full speed, all the while I maintain my momentum on the keys. The loud groan of my sleeping giant means the dog running through the house is enough. I tuck the ball under me and now the dog is aggressively searching for her toy. A low growl becomes a playful yap. My eyes widen and I freeze. The dog freezes. Shh. I hand her the ball and tiptoe into the den. Sitting on the big oversized recliner, the story flows from my fingertips. I tap out words that I didn't even know I knew. My clarity is amazing. The manuscript is a masterpiece. The protagonist struggles and I have all the answers to her dilemma. Like a mad puppeteer, I toy with her page after page, only allowing her to overcome bits of conflict at a time. And just as I hit my literary crescendo, the low battery warning flashes on my screen. <laughs> the cord to my computer is next to the bed, plugged in behind the headboard. I know I can't get to it in any demure way. I save the file, and with the computer tucked under my arm, I may make my way back to bed. My side is cold. I close my eyes and match the rhythm of his breathing. When his alarm goes off, it startles me. 
He glances my way before rolling out of bed. He has words to say about how I kept him up all night, but I'm ready to counter. It wasn't all night. <laughs> Knowing good and well that five hours of night riding is all night. While he brushes his teeth, I plug in my computer and tap out a last few words. Aww. Thank you. I loved hearing you read that. I don't, yeah. Thank you. Night riding. Okay. So. I want to bring up our next reader, um, who will be Donna Kennedy. And if, for those who have read the newspaper for a long time, you might recognize her name, but we're very happy to have her as part of this column as well. It's only been 20 years since I left the Press Enterprise, if you might. I'm amazed if you remember. It's, it's great fun to, uh, to see something that I've written in the Press Enterprise again. Um, I've been with, in the Atlanta column for only a couple of years, so I'm a newcomer. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm a newcomer to this column. Um, this, uh, this column was uh, ran in August last year, and it's quite personal. Writing has been my constant companion. It gave me a voice, a career, and when I needed it most, gave me a way to face personal tragedy. Many have experienced the art of writing as a path to healing and growth, so I add my story to that hard-won collection. Journalism came first, beginning with a weekly column in eighth grade and continuing with high school and college newspapers, plus my mother's monthly salt and seafarer. My first uh, real job was with the Press Enterprise. I wrote about people's tragedies, struggles, and triumphs and in between read short stories and novels. And sometimes I was lucky enough to interview local novelists like Susan Strait and Gail Brandeis. Although I adored fiction, writing it never occurred to me. My ideas were limited to what I heard in interviews with other people. But then came the dark times. My daughter was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. Her twin sister had died of uh, heart problems as an infant. I refused to believe my remaining child was in danger. She had recently danced on the beach with the Santa Barbara Dance Theater. She and her percussionist boyfriend were planning a life together. At 22, her adult life was just beginning. No, this could not be possible. Somehow I needed to maintain strength for her sake as well as my own. Initially, journalism had been my artistic foundation, but Joseph Campbell's mythic motif of the hero's journey became a touchstone of support for me and for a series of articles. His call to adventure, the refusal of the call, the acceptance, and finally the return home broadened my interest in writing. I sought answers and listened to the heroes I interviewed. How did you survive your loss? What was your path? They generously shared the books, music, movies, and beliefs that had been their candles in the darkness, and I passed these on to Press Enterprise readers. My daughter called the series My Spirit Stories. After she died at 28, I was a different person, and I awakened each morning in shock with the same thought. My child is dead. The only way I could stop my repetitive dark thoughts was art, a familiar path recommended by countless artists and philosophers. With pen and ink, I could narrow my focus to a graceful blade of grass or an intricate cluster of milkweed blossoms and draw them without conscious thought, the way I'd learned in Zen Seeing, Zen Drawing by Frederick Franck. Mythology returned when my husband and I enrolled at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Carpinteria. The academic papers I wrote, such as a study of the goddess Demeter, whose daughter Persephone was taken to the underworld by Hades, helped me to put my grief in perspective. Writing poetry also helped me function during those first years. Looking at these pages now, dozens of them, I see glimmers of healing and self-knowledge, despite my continuing rage against the universe. <laughs> I often wrote little fragments like, why should I go to work when poetry drips like blood from my fingertips? <laughs> Suddenly, I found I did have the imagination for fiction. I wrote a novella about a woman searching for her childhood dolls, all parts of her personality, and a novel about a shape-shifting child. I loved writing them, although they are as yet unpublished. Nine years ago, life took another unexpected turn. My husband and I became legal guardians of his son's five-year-old twins. 
With my writing time and energy diverted to child raising, I began writing very short pieces, often inspired by the children. A conversation with my granddaughter became a mini memoir that was published by Perspectives magazines in 2018. Here is an excerpt. One morning, a few months after they'd moved in, my granddaughter asked if I had any children of my own. I did, I said, but she died when she was 28. I pointed to her picture on the wall. The photographer had caught my daughter in mid-leap, her ponytail flying in an RCC production of West Side Story. Clutching her favorite blanket, my granddaughter looked at me and back at the picture. She's not old enough to be dead. I nodded. Do you miss her? Yes. She stroked the satin edge of her blanket. It helps that we're here, doesn't it? Like writers before me. Oh, so another one? Yeah. Like what? Am I on? No. These batteries are really not equal. I lost her for brand batteries. Testing? Okay. Like writers before me, I can always find a style or form or genre of writing that soothes, excites, or challenges me. Sometimes I even find joy, and I discover humor in real life, like these lines that pop to mind when preparing my online LinkedIn profile. My resume reads, calm, rational writer, can transport skunks in emergencies. <laughs> An unusual skill, but one worth mentioning. I am a different person since my daughter's illness and death so many years ago, yet I remember, I recognize my former self in there somewhere. Like many others on the same path, writing and art have helped me gather and arrange my thoughts into a measure, measure of coherence. All along, writing has been the key element in the equation. Thank you so much, Donna. And as you've heard, many of these essays are very personal and we're putting them out there for public consumption. Um, and I, I think writing, writing does heal. So um, I want to continue on with our readers. So uh, next up, we have Cindy Neisinger. Come on up, Cindy. Bring it down a notch here. Yeah, Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. You may wonder how a Chicana became involved in the tiki pop culture. Well, let me tell you. In 2018, I was busy fighting Trumpers. Remember that? The political climate was hot and heavy. I was going to a lot of writers' workshops. I'm known as a workshopaholic. I had just attended an Inlandia workshop called a one-day boot camp for indie publishing with Marge Charlier. She gave us a brief history of book covers. Remember that part. Two weeks later, the event in this article happened. Headline, Dust-covered volume of Don the Beachcomber Archives is Tiki Treasure Trove. Riverside woman finds rare 1940s book in her late father's shed. If you can't get to paradise, I'll bring it to you, Don Beach. I will never look at a tiki mug or Hawaiian shirt the same way again. I used to think tiki was quiche, but not anymore. Here's a story of how I found a rare 1940s book of Don the Beachcomber documents with some Chicago mob flavor in Riverside, California. One of its destinations ended up being a Beverly Hills auction house. We'll need ambiance for this. Alexa, play Hawaiian music, please. 
It must have been serendipity or fate. My 94-year-old stepfather had passed away the year before, and I moved in with my elderly mother to help her. One stormy morning, I went outside to feed the feral cats living in my stepfather's workshop. As I moved some old blankets where they slept, I noticed an old, rusty utility shelf. And on the lowest shelf, a large red leather book with gold embossed lettering. It was layered with so much dust I couldn't make out the title. After carefully wiping it off, I could read the name, Don the Beachcomber Incorporated. Curious, I couldn't Google it fast enough. Little did I know my adventure into tiki Dum had just begun. Enter Ernest Beaumont Gant, aka Don E.R. Beachcomber, and then Don Beach, thanks to an illegal name change. Don's beloved grandfather was a rum runner who let him tag along as a child of seven in 2014. On adventures to exotic lands, his father was an oil rigger during the oil boom on his, and on his sixth try, finally struck a gusher in Mejia, Texas. When Don was a young man, he was given a choice, college or travel. Don chose the latter and circled around the world, the world twice before landing in Hollywood Road. He brought home many Polynesian treasures that would eventually decorate his first bar. After a couple of lucrative years later, he added food to the menu and moved to a bigger location across the street where he met his wife, socialite, Cora Irene Sunny Sun. It became an exclusive restaurant with a dress code filled with Hollywood elites, including Rudy Valley, the Marx Brothers, Mae West, Howard Hughes, and Charlie Chaplin. Don brought in an air of escapism during the Great Depression and after Prohibition. His Polynesian-themed restaurants were legendary, complete with rain effects from a hose on a corrugated metal <laughs> rooftop. He thought it would make patrons stay longer if it was raining. Brilliantly, it worked. A colorful minor bird wa would walk up the edge of the bar, screeching, give me a beer, stupid. <laughs> After Pearl Harbor, he proudly joined the war effort. He became a captain in the U.S. Army Air Corps then joined a convoy that started in Casablanca, near French Morocco. He earned two Purple Hearts in World War II. While he was gone, Sonny was running, ran the business. She prospered and expanded, but when he came back from the war, everything had changed. His wife had partnered with Joey Jacobson and Mike Fritzel, owners of the famous Chez Paris in, nightclub in Chicago, a well-known Al Capone and hangout for Al Capone and his cronies. It's rumored they pushed Don out of the business. Divorces can be messy and sometimes it's best just to move away. So Don went, so Don went to Hawaii and opened a new Polynesian themed restaurant and the international marketplace with his now famous Banyan Treehouse office which is still in Waikiki today. He was honored with the House Resolution Tourism Award in 1957. Don had many more seafaring adventures until he died in 1989. He left a lasting legacy as a legendary forefather of mixology. The book of rare documents I found reads like a diary, documenting the genesis of all things tiki and the Don the Beachcomber restaurants. Even Riverside's Mission Inn Hotel joined the Polynesian craze with the Lele Room, a bar in dance club in the 1960s. The Lele Room allowed Mission Inn visitors to travel through time and space, decorated with Asian statues, lanterns, floating globes, cranes, pagodas, fishnets, and even a koi pond. I found the books in the spring of 2018 and sold it in December to Profiles in History, an auction house in Beverly Hills. The anticipation buzz from such avid collectors in the tiki world was exciting. I was hoping for a bidding war. But when the moment came, the gavel came down quickly and the auction was over in a second. The book went for $2,250. Not quite what I was hoping for, but enough for a great Christmas. <laughs> there are tiki events and new venues still springing up all over, kind of like a tiki re-revival of sorts. Just Google tiki and take those Hawaiian shirts and moo's out of the back of the closet. 
We can sure use Don's kind of whimsical escapism, even a Mai Tai or two, in this unnerving, constant, breaking news political climate. What? Wait, I don't want to kill the ambiance. Mahalo. <laughs> I, just to, I just want to say, as a follow-up, I did get contacted um, like 10 months later, but um, let's see. So organized, I'm not organized. This article went to print in 2019, Super Bowl Sunday, and it, at the end of the year, I received this message. Hi, Cindy, so glad I finally found you. I'm working on this documentary with my production company, Surf Monkey Films. <clears throat> I can't find my other note. So they are, the movie is complete, the documentary is done, but now there is a writer's strike. So as soon as I find out, uh, a release date, I will be letting everybody know, and I was told that I should do a follow-up article, so I will yeah. be doing that. Yeah. And I am an animated character in the movie. I will be in a bar somewhere, and don't blink. <laughs> Thank you. That's a major success story. <laughs> I don't think any of us can say, the rest of us can say that we were contacted and now we're a character, an animated character in a movie. You guys hear it in the We do. Yeah, that is totally cool. Okay. Yes, we didn't each bring our own ambiance. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but Cindy, everywhere she goes. Thank you, Cindy. All right. So... This time, I'm going to change our screen before I bring up our next reader. Uh, we have with us next Juanita Mance. Come on up, Juanita. Thank you, Katie. I appreciate it. Um, this one is from, I have my right glasses. 50 year old eyes. So this one's from 2022, September 3rd. Writing a memoir and capturing your own truth is tricky but worth it. As a memoirist, family is everything to me. My second book, Tales of an Inland Empire Girl, was published earlier this year by Los Nietos Press. It's a true tale about me and my sisters growing up in the Inland Empire with my Caucasian truck driving father cowboy father, and my Mexican hardworking waitress of a mother. Time period-wise, my book is set primarily in the 1970s and 1980s of Ontario, California. Although the Inland Empire and the time period play a huge role, the main component is family. The memoir describes my family and my childhood, along with my young adult years, in short vignettes that I strung together. It also details my path from punk rock high school dropout to USC educated lawyer. My childhood and young adult years were more than a bit chaotic at times, and I had to show the chaos to tell my story. Writing about someone's family, especially when there is dysfunction, can be a tricky endeavor. Memories and perspectives differ, and everyone has their own truth, ask my twin. At one point in the more than decade long journey and bringing my book to fruition, I considered putting the project aside. Things were getting tense with my siblings and my mom about me writing the book. There were disagreements about what story said factually and about whose story it was to tell. I, I, like I said, I'm getting old, I gotta follow along. It was heartbreaking and stressful and yet, I knew I was meant to write the book. The problem was, I didn't know how to navigate the stormy waters of memoir and truth telling with my family. I persevered and we worked it out, but it was hard. It took more than a few years. The book took 15 years totally. So you see, the point is, my mom and my sisters are everything to me. I didn't want to slight them. It took a lot of introspection, research, revision, self-growth, to be able to tell my tales with integrity and grace, 
while honoring the memories and my own truth about my childhood. As a result, like I said, the book took 15 years from writing to publication. But the memoir is a much better book as a result of me taking the time to get it right. My story opens with the day my dad died. In the story, I'm a San Francisco civil lit litigator, not yet a Riverside County public defender. And then it flashes back to my childhood. Out of all the stories, the first story called The Shit Day was the hardest to write. In fact, I couldn't write it in a traditional way. It started out as a performance piece that I dictated to myself. My voice is different in it, but somehow it captures that trauma of having to let my dad go and telling the paramedics they could stop. My dad's death so many years ago was not pretty or peaceful as I had always imagined it to be. Instead, it was surreal and traumatizing. The day was also transformative and I had to illustrate that day and tell my story to show the epiphany that I had been running from home for far too long. Ultimately, my dad's death made me realize that I needed to come home, both literally and figuratively. The day made me realize that I desperately yearned for my family and for my hometown, and that they in turn needed me. So I moved back home, back to the Inland Empire where I said I would never come back to. And eventually I quit big firm civil law and made my way to the public defender's office in Riverside. In the end, although it is not a fairy tale, my story had a happy ending. I came home to my community and I stayed. My next project in the works is an adaptation of my book to the stage. I anticipate writing a screenplay after that. This will put all my family drama before the world. Oh, get ready. <laughs> but more importantly, it will bring my father back to life, albeit figuratively, on the stage and hopefully one day on the silver screen. What I am trying to say, I guess, in this article is that the reason memoir is hard is because it's personal. It would have been easier to fictionalize it, much easier, but no one would have seen my family's true beauty, warts and all, especially the character of my father. Growing up, my dad would sometimes tell me in his slow Montana drawl, one day, Jenny, you're going to miss me when I'm gone. And I do. I so do. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we've had a lot of, of stories about loss today. Um, all right, so we're down to our last reader, and then Johnny and I will close it out. So I would like to bring up Madeline Simmons. Come on up, Maddie. Hi. Can it, it, oh, okay. I just wasn't holding close. <laughs> Hi, my, uh, my name's Marilyn Simmons, and so I've been writing for about three years. Uh, I started when I was doing an internship, and uh, you know, they haven't kicked me out since, which has been great. <laughs> and um, it's been so wonderful to have a space to write about the things that really matter to me. And uh, you know, I, the article that I'm going to read is an article that was just published today. I wanted to read something that was, you know, uh, for 10 years, you know, 10 uh, years. And so uh, when I wrote this article for uh, May, I wanted to do something for uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. You know, I, I never imagined that uh, a week and a half before it was published, uh, a man going through a mental health crisis on a New York subway uh, would be strangled to death. Um, but you know, here we are, Jordan Neely is dead and the narratives surrounding him have created uh, the same story we have seen in movies and books, demonizing people with uh, mental illness and mental health issues. Uh, his murderer uh, is praised a hero and still walks free. Um, and you know, we have this issue and um, it's what we're doing here at Inlandia and what I've seen with all of you reading, it's um, changing the narratives that are being written you know, we're rewriting it and we're telling our stories and, um, you know, what's so important, what we're doing here. So.
So thank you guys. So I'm going to read my article. Writing uh, daily is good for your mental health, and here's why. So writing in good might not be what people typically put together. Um, in a sentence uh, in the month of May, Mental Health Awareness Month, but I wanted to highlight the ways that we actually benefit from it. As an educator, I hear a lot of groans when it comes to writing, despite it being an activity we engage in daily. We just aren't mindful of the writing we are doing, especially as we can become backlogged in keeping up with work emails and other things. There is a lot of studies that have cataloged the multiple benefits of writing. The most recent one, efficiency of journaling and management of all mental illness. Um, they've showed that time spent writing about our inner thoughts and feelings can reduce the number of sick days we take off of work. Um, and they observed that writing for longer than 30 days is when mental well-being benefits really start to kick in. Their research also suggests that writing, particularly expressive writing, can help those experiencing or recovering from emotional trauma associated with PTSD. Uh, another 2022 study um, highlights writing's ability to heal and the recovery of women is in residential treatment from substance abuse disorders. Results showed that the intervention helped participants to recognize what was positive about recovery, achieve meaningful short-term goals, and experience a sense of optimism and pride in their accomplishments. And so to help start writing, here are some prompts that I came up with below to help you start with going through. So um, one, write a list of things you are most anxious about or uncertain about, then create a map laying out where you see the anxieties and uncertainties lingering. Like, is it most often you notice it in a room in your home or workplace, or is it a person? If it's a bigger concern, make it larger and vice versa. Create an image to the best of your abilities. Once drawn, write your impressions of your mapped out concerns and how visually seeing them all in one place makes you feel. Two, how would you describe yourself from the perspective of your favorite fictional character? How would you like to be seen in their eyes? Three, think about a difficult situation you were involved in. How would that difficult situation be handled if you were able to prepare for it? Also, how would that favorite fictional character um, handle that situation? Um, as you can see, I wrote a lot of these in mind for younger kids. <laughs> and then four, chart your favorite memories from your life. After doing so, take a look at where those favorite memories cluster, or take notice if they are scattered about. If they are clustered, what were you doing that time that's different from the other times in your life? If they are scattered, see if you notice any patterns or connections you can make from how they, you were doing at each time in your life. Writing for our mental health has many benefits, such as supporting physical and mental well-being, resilience, and greater emotional wellness understanding being just a couple of them. Writing allows us to see that we, what we think and feel is not just who we are, but something we are experiencing. It provides a space where we can view our negative or self-critical thoughts as just that, thoughts. With practice, writing can help us process heavy emotions, even ones that have been avoided or held back and lead to a better understanding of how to keep moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie, and that seems very appropriate given today and that yours just published. So, yay. So now um, I'm going to bring up Johnny Bender, who's <laughs> in one of his alter egos there. Oh, that's Henry Heaven. Oh, Henry Heaven. That's Henry Heaven. He took the train from San Bernardino Station to Chicago, and uh, along the way he read in the dining car. Um, you took the typewriter, too. Yeah, yeah, I took the typewriter. Now my memory just went. Uh, who wrote the poem, Chicago? Right, right, right. Henry right. read that in the dining car on the train, outside of the town. All right. But we digress. So I'm going to read a poem that I wrote. When I write poems or stories, I like to sit alone on the front porch in the cool morning, drinking coffee and thinking without distraction. 
I write better when the temperatures are below 80 degrees and the morning light softens and beautifies the Box Springs Mountain near my house in Moreno Valley. It's as though I'm part of a panoramic desert scene. Recently, though, I was not pleased to discover a small nest of wasps attached to my patio eaves. I was even less pleased when two wasps flew over to check out what I was doing. Should I get rid of them? Or would they leave me alone if I ignored them? And if I did try to remove their nest, would they swarm and sting? I look up photos online, and I think they're European paper wasps. Graceful insects with thin waists. They're described as social beings that prefer to leave people alone unless threatened. Good. I didn't have to do anything. I could get back to coffee and thinking. Except for their thin waists, these wasps seem just like most poets and writers I know. <laughs> I describe most poets and writers as semi-social. They work alone, but their goal is to share their creations with readers and listeners. Most love going to poetry readings, book releases, and book fairs, and socializing with other writers. Most writers have The mic swap. Most writers never make the big time, but they don't give up. Maybe that next book will be the one. It's been a few weeks since I first noticed the small nest of wasps, and I've been careful not to get stung. I've left them their half of the porch, and they've multiplied. There are probably about a dozen of them now, flying out on errands and returning later to tend their queen. Early in the morning, I like to watch them in their nest, barely moving. Now, before COVID, I would have vacuumed them up with my shop vac, but now I leave them be. Occasionally, they'll get more active and fly around me in a semi-threatening manner. Those are the times when I go inside, making sure the porch, the screen door shuts tight behind me. I don't really know how the pandemic turned me into a wasp lover. Per perhaps it's because they live uncompromised, caring for one another, and they're always working to improve their community. Hold on, there's another page to this. I know how to do that. Okay. Perhaps it's because I'm doing the same thing. I'm caregiver for an elderly relative, and I help prepare meals and ease the day-to-day -day struggles of other loved ones. I'm part of a community of poets, writers, and musicians, rebuilding as we emerge from the recent viral difficulties. I still have my stinger, I just prefer not to use it. I'd rather circle and frighten away my threats. And those porch wasps still haven't stung me. Thank goodness. Thank you, John. I, and I remember when you wrote that, not so long ago. So, yeah, that was, that was fun. So I'm gonna close this out. Um, but if you are a columnist, before um, you leave, I would love for us to take a group photo. So yeah, so come up to the front when we're done. Um, so I'm gonna read you the very, very first column that came out. <laughs> it was mine, April 29th, 2013. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And it was actually very early on in my tenure as executive director. Um, I hadn't written that much prose before, so it was it was different for me to start writing um, in a different mode from my poet brain. So, Inlandia Institute, Inland, Inland Area is Full of Literary Talent. That is the, the title. This column, Inlandia's Literary Journeys, marks the beginning of the next leg of our journey as readers, writers, thinkers, and members of the Inlandia community, thanks in large part to the vision and creative, inclusive spirit of the Press Enterprise. Watch this space every Tuesday, of course now it's Sunday, for more from In Inlandia's writers offering writerly support, sharing what they're reading, talking about words and stories, and all things in Landia that are taking place throughout the region. We are all in Landia. 
I have found myself repeating this a lot lately, but I hadn't stopped to really think about what it means, not until today. It's just a string of four words, 16 letters, about an inch long when laid out in type. In the air, they are just sounds, seven syllables, stressed and unstressed. And to someone who doesn't speak the language, irrelevant and meaningless is birdsong or the whistle of a passing train. But in truth, those sounds are neither irrelevant nor meaningless. Birdsong can mean spring, can mean morning. A train whistle can mean danger or adventure or just passing through. At their core, each sound, each object, each person that we encounter tells a story about what's going on around us. I want to say that when I say we are all in Landia, it means we are all in this together. But that too isn't enough. My impulse is to say that it means we are what makes this place our home. But really, it's more like we are all a part of the same story. Every day we collaborate and educate each other in ways that are difficult to measure. And every day we tell each other stories. Every time we open our mouths to speak, pick up a phone, pick up a pen, it is an act of engagement with each other, with language, with meaning. It is evidence of our humanity. I want to say that the stories we tell each other are as important to our existence as the air that we breathe. They are vital, not just because of this information they convey, but because they create an instant connection between speaker and listener, between reader and writer, between mother and child and father and brother and friend and lover and the grocery clerk and the gas station attendant and the banker and the guy driving who cuts you off as you merge onto the freeway. Inlandia isn't just a place. It is all of us. We make this place. Every day we build upon a network of made connections, each of our individual stories coming together to tell a collective story about who we are as a community. The Inlandia Institute was founded in order to share our story with the world and to provide literary and cultural enrichment to all of those who contribute to the literary life of this area, a region which stretches from Joshua Tree and the Salton Sea down into Temecula and Hemet and Murrieta, encompassing all of San Bernardino and Riverside counties. The Inlandia Institute's aim is to support and represent all areas, however far flung. So, let's see. I think I'll, I'll leave it there because the end of the column talks about events that we're going to be hosting. And, you know, that was a long time ago now. <laughs> but, um, but I feel like those words are really still relevant today. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to click one more time because while uh, many of us were here today, these are all people who have written for the column who are not here, and I want to recognize them, although some of them are Romaine's here. Hi, Romaine! Yay! Um, we have had so many wonderful columns and columnists, so many points of view from all across the whole inland region. So, um, and if you're here and you haven't written for the column and you want to, let me know, because I would love to have your voice in Among the Mix. So thank you for being here. Thank you, John Bender. Like, can we give John and the press, and we'll even, we're gonna give a shout out to David Allen, who's here from the press. So, and thank you to our friends at the press for continuing to host us. So with that, uh, yeah, the end. <laughs> and come up to the front for a picture. Oh. I know, I can't wait.